McCarthy, um, and I'm organizing this year's McCarthy Lecture Series. The poster you've hopefully seen around town or around the LAB. If not, there's info on our website and so forth. Um, this year's theme is called Spy Games, War and Espionage in the 20th Century. And we kicked the series off last <laughs> fall with one talk, and then now we are resuming this evening um, with one talk every second week until the end of February. Um, on February 12th, I'm going to be giving a talk about my new book project about the women of the Special Operations Executive, um, the branch of British intelligence that sent wi uh, women and men into occupied Europe as spies. Um, that talk will be called Those Very Gallant Women, Gender and Espionage in World War II Europe. Um, then on February 26th, Dr. Larry Berman from Georgia State University will give a talk about his book entitled Perfect Spy, The Incredible Double Life of Fan Juan and I meant to ask Dr. Stir if I was saying that correctly, but uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Time Magazine reporter and Vietnamese communist agents. And all of the talks are going to begin at 6 p.m. here in the Liberal Arts Building. Uh, before I introduce uh, tonight's speaker, I first want to acknowledge uh, the patrons of the McCarthy Lecture Series are longtime supporters, Dr. Dr. Richard McCarthy and Dr. Craig Howard, who I saw, and I'm now not seeing. Oh, there they are. Yeah. Uh, uh, who have been amongst our earliest supporters here in the Dale Center and whose um, contributions have enabled us to go keep this lecture series going now in its 14th year. Um, we've had a lot of great events that have been tied to the McCarthy Lecture Series. Um, and if you're interested in checking out some of the older uh, events and lectures, you can do that via the Dale Center YouTube channel. Um, and tonight's talk will also be up there, as will all of the McCarthy Lectures on the Spy Games theme, if there are some that you cannot um, attend. Also, if you want more information about the McCarthy Lecture Series or uh, Dale Center programming in general, um, there's a lot of literature back there on the uh, credenza or cabinet or whatever we want to call it, so please make sure to check that out on your way out. There's also a sign-in sheet um, or sign-up sheet if you want to receive emails, um, join our, our contacts list to get information about events and news within um, the Dale Center. There's also a separate sign-up sheet for students. If uh, you are a Southern Miss student, please let us know that you were here. Um, and the last thing I'll say before I introduce our speaker uh, is that you can also follow the Dale Center on uh, Facebook and Twitter. In fact, if you want to tweet about tonight's event, I've put um, our uh, Twitter handle there on the whiteboard. We're at Dale Center, and you can do hashtag McCarthy Lectures. So please feel free to do that, but also make sure that you silence your phone if you are going to be tweeting. Right, that's enough. I no, don't need, I don't need, need inter yeah. no, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk, I'm, that's fine. Okay, no, 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 no. no. I'm going to. Seriously, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's going to be longer. No, I mean, okay. it's just, it's, can I just say, if you're a speaker to America, it's ridiculous, because in Britain, they say, here is Bloggs, who comes from the University of X, get on with it, Bloggs, as it were. <laughs> in America, they go on forever, and the people that actually lose out are the audience. Okay, but how do you know that's not what I was just going to say? Well, that's fine, okay. just say it. <laughs> what I wanted to tell you is that Jerry Black, here, uh, to my left, is a world-renowned scholar of military history. Yeah, well, you see, look, that doesn't do anything. Let's just, I'm, right. I have more information. Uh, <laughs> no, come on, let's just talk about James Bond. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted, I am delighted, thank you. No, 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 no. I am delighted to be here. I am delight. I've been here before. I am delighted to see how well the programme has developed, and it is a great pleasure to be here. It is rather odd to be here in these weather conditions with you responding like this, because compared to Britain, this is actually quite warm today, all right? But I feel for you in your suffering, and I will, next time I come, I'll try and bring a food parcel and thermal underwear or whatever you need. Okay, James Bond. Why talk about it if you're a historian? Well, partly because cultural effects, cultural images are part of the way in which we see ourselves and see the world around us. And it's interesting to think about which ones have succeeded well and how they have changed through time. And James Bond is probably the best example I can think of. He's been going, if you include the novels, and that was the first novel, came out in 1953. He's been going for a long time, over 60 years. Um, he fights it out with Star Wars as the second or top uh, film franchise in world history. 
So, you know, uh, it's been reckoned since about 15 years ago that more than half the world's population has seen a James Bond film. Now, if you think about that, that itself is of interest to a historian. What I want to try and do is to go back to the beginning, go back to the Bond of the novels, because that's probably the Bond you know least about, and talk about how Bond emerged as a Cold War figure, try and discuss a bit about why he was a successful creation, and then take Bond through to the present day, looking at the changes that have occurred in the way Bond is presented, and trying to link those up with cultural, social and political change. I've got to do as much of that as I can in an hour. Um, Alison mentions I've written a book on it. I've actually written a couple of books on Bond. Um, I hope what I'm going to say is interesting and coherent. I cannot cover everything. So if I miss things out, please don't assume that I'm slighting your favourite film or whatever. I've just got to follow the course I'm going to take. Right, 1953, Casino Royale. The first novel of somebody called Ian Fleming. I'll briefly give you a bio of him because the bio itself is interesting as an example of how British society changed. So Fleming, 1908 to 64, died quite young, you'll notice, uh, doing that most dangerous of things, playing golf. But Fleming, uh, born in 1908, was born at a time when Britain was a uniquely successful state running the world's largest empire, extraordinarily prosperous, and Fleming was built, was born at that level of society. Uh, he came from a family that had been merchant bankers and was still very important in banking. His father was a conservative member of parliament. He was born in a situation of great opulence. And the last thing you would have expected somebody from that position to do, particularly somebody who is a rampant snob, and Fleming was a rampant snob all of his life, uh, was actually to do something like write for money. So part of the interest is how a man of that type ends up writing for money and worrying about about the money he is going to receive or not. Anyway, Fleming's world comes to pieces really in World War I. World War I for Britain is much more traumatic than it is for the United States. I know many Americans died in World War I. I've seen the War Memorial at Yale, but actually it was a bit of a toy town war for the Americans. For the British and the French and the Germans that lost vast numbers of men, and that included Fleming's father. He had the rather unusual idea in modern terms, not unusual in the terms of his generation, that if you sent people to war, you ought to be willing to volunteer and fight yourself. And although he was too old to need to fight, um, so he wouldn't have even been conscripted, but he was already gone to war before conscription came, because the first two years it was just volunteers, he volunteers to fight and gets killed. Um, so Fleming um, is left uh, at the, uh, with his siblings at the care of his mother, who, you know, this is not intended as a critical remark. I think, you know, you lose a spouse in war, it is a traumatic event. But she sort of really rather turned to drink and spiritualism, which a lot of people did. Spiritualism has an enormous vogue in Britain after the war as people try and, you know, co contact the, the dead. Um, I, in a way that, in a sense, didn't matter as much as it should have done, because Fleming, as an upper-class boy, took part in that system of child abuse known as British public school education. In, uh, and as you know, the curious way about the British language, a public school is a private school, but we'll leave that to one side. So he goes off to the most famous public school, Eton, where, interestingly enough, he overlaps with all sorts of famous people. Um, I mean, to give you an idea, um, you know, Fleming's there at the same time as George Orwell. He's there at the same time as Burgess, the most famous traitor of the century. He's there with all sorts of people. And of course, most of his life, um, uh, his adult life, there are going to be old Etonians as prime ministers. Um, um, you know, Anthony Eden, Harold Macmillan. So anyway, he goes to Eton. He's quite a success as sport. He's the top sportsman two years running, which is not bad for a school of about 1,400 pupils. He is not interested in books at all. 
Um, and in fact, he doesn't go to university. Those days, and there's a long tradition, people who went to the university were the sort of vulgar little ticks that needed to actually get a job. A gentleman didn't go to university. And um, he doesn't go to university. He does, he's not in the, 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 the stream that is even going to think of going to university. He goes to the army. Uh, which is a sort of thing, uh, fashionable regiments are the sort of things that upper class boys go into. So he goes into the army in the 1920s, uh, and the army isn't a great success for Fleming. Uh, several reasons for that. Um, he liked going, he goes to Sandhurst, the officer training corps, uh, he liked going to parties in London, coming back very late, in the, or rather, rather early in the morning, depending on your point of view, uh, which was not very good from the army's point of view. Uh, got drunk quite a lot, and the army wasn't amused when he got venereal disease. So they threw him out. They threw him out. He's then not really sure what he wants to do. And he decides it might be interesting to be a journalist. So he goes and joins Reuters and gets sent out to Moscow to cover the Vickers spy trial. These are the trials of British engineers in uh, the Soviet Union who are being tried for espionage. And it's probably at that stage that Fleming first has contacts with the intelligence services in Britain. It was an established pattern to use journalists as a, a sort of occasional reporters, as it were. So most famously, another one of the great spies for the Soviet Union, Phil, Kim Philby, uh, was the economist man in Beirut. Um, but, you know, so Fleming probably joins or starts providing information to British intelligence at that period. He gets a bit bored with uh, journalism and he's prevailed upon by members of his family to become a stockbroker on the grounds it would be quite a good idea to have somebody in the family looking after the family um, assets. So he becomes a stockbroker and that's what he's doing when World War II breaks out. Now, World War II, again, traumatic, but for a lot of the people involved, it was the most exciting thing in their life. Uh, you know, it took them out of their existing uh, route. I, re I remember talking to the elderly lady that lived opposite where I grew up, and, you know, she'd done war work, in the, and she said to me, you know, <laughs> World War II, she said it was really exciting. She said, you know, getting away from work, from home, getting away from the control of your parents, and, you know, you might get killed. It was, you know, things were getting, London was getting bombed heavily, but really exciting. Fleming doesn't get the excitement he wants. He wants to fight. I suspect, because he, he was in the shadow of his father, who'd been a war hero, as it were, dying, and he wanted to do the same, but um, he's regarded as too old, and he goes in instead to uh, military intelligence, the naval branch thereof. And he becomes the assistant to the head of naval intelligence, and that's how he spends his war. Now, what, me what that means, he's not at the kinetic end of intelligence, in other words, he's not going to break anybody's neck, um, but he does go on some foreign missions. He goes to Lisbon, which was a major listening station uh, for all the intelligence services, for the British, but also in particularly for the Abwehr, um, probably a place where the Abwehr and the British um, intelligence services also, as it were, swapped information, because the British were trying, of course, to get the ad there to bump off Hitler. Um, he goes to uh, the United States, he goes to the West Indies, um, he has a fascinating time, he likes it enormously. And then after the war, he hits trouble because the socialists come in. Now, there had been two Labour governments before, in 1924 and in 1929 and 31, but those governments had not enjoyed a majority of seats in Parliament and therefore had not been able to get through their, their, um, their tax redistribution legislation. The Labour government that comes in in 1945, and after a re-election is in power uh, till 51, actually has a parliamentary majority. The country is bankrupt, I mean literally bankrupt, with an enormous debt to the Americans. Americans are sort of bullying the British to pay it back as well. Uh, but the country is bankrupt and the socialists want to push through their sort of social policy, including the establishment of the National Health Service. That means that tax rates go very high and they go particularly high for what is known as unearned income. Unearned income is what you would call dividends, share, you know. And that's essentially how Fleming 
has family money his. So Fleming's paying marginal rate taxation of over 90%. And, you know, he can't live on that, he can't, you know, certainly can't sustain his lifestyle. And he's not helped the matter by, in terms of finances, by acquiring a very, very, very expensive mistress and then marrying her. Um, his, uh, his mistress, uh, Anne, uh, was the wife of Lord Rothermere, Viscount Rothermere. She was a Viscountess. Uh, he was, uh, Viscount Rothermere was her second husband. Her first husband had died, had been killed in the war. And uh, she and Fleming start an affair. Uh, Rothermere himself is having an affair with somebody else, so you know it's all part of British society of that period. Um, but, but the um, it goes a bit wrong. She gets pregnant. Uh, her husband isn't particularly, by Fleming, isn't particularly pleased about that. There are rows and ructions. And in the end of the day, she gets divorced. Rothermere also wants to get divorced so that he can get remarry his mistress. And what? Ha and she, you know, Anne ends up with Fleming, who can't afford her. She has very expensive tastes. Three houses. House on Victoria Square, which is a very attractive address in London, place in the country, place on the north shore of Jamaica. And can't afford that, and he sets out to write for money. Now that's the most important thing. Now before you all go shock horror, because you know people who, particularly English lit people, tend to sort of idealise those people sitting in garrets and you know, actually a lot of great writers, uh, Anthony Trollope for example, who had a marvellous job for the post office but wanted to live as the life of a really affluent country gentleman, just got up at five o'clock every morning and started writing. So lots of people have done this, but Fleming falls into that tradition which helps to explain how and why he writes. He's trying to write what he regards as interesting and likely to sell. That's quite important. Secondly, he decides he's going to try and coin a version of his experience. Now, he's had the experience of naval intelligence. After the war, he gets a job, and he gets a job as running the foreign correspondence for the Sunday Times. That's the Times of London, not the Times of New York, OK? Um, and as I said, in that period, um, there is the intelligence links with the foreign journalist system. On top of that, um, Fleming had met a number of senior American figures in the intelligence world during the war. He'd met Donovan, the head of the OSS, he'd met J. Edgar Hoover, and they kept, he kept that link going after the war. So that he had a sort of vague idea of not just of what the British were doing, well, um, quite a good idea, but also of what the Americans were doing. So 1953 is the novel which he starts with, and it's a novel, I don't know whether you've read it or not, it's a novel which, start, which includes an enormous amount of what we would call tradecraft. Tradecraft is knowing how to do it, okay? You know, how do you kill somebody if you haven't got um, a weapon with you? Uh, how do you do it without uh, uh, putting too much pressure on yourself, shall we say? Uh, things like that. Now, he's, got a, he's good on his tradecraft. Um, he also bases it on something that was not wildly different from something the Americans had done in the late 40s. The essential plot of Casino Royale is, is the idea is that the Soviets have penetrated the main French railway trade union, which indeed to this day is still a communist trade union, um, and that they are going to use that in the event of World War III to block NATO movements. You know, because road trains were those then much more important. And the British set out to do what, in fact, the Americans had set out to do in the late 40s, which is compromise and overturn um, communist elements in both France and Italy. And that's what it's about. And it's actually quite a tightly written book. It's all set in Royale, which is a fictional place, but is based on two places, Deville and Le Touquet, French resorts on the Channel Coast, uh, gambling resorts, uh, about which Fleming knew an enormous amount. He was a keen gambler. Um, and it starts in a casino, and it's very much written in a very tight fashion. It's actually a very good story, um, probably one of the best of the stories that he wrote. It does well. And doing well, I mean, at that stage, paper is still being rationed. 
I mean, Britain has rationing into the mid-1950s. Uh, paper is still being rationed. There aren't all that many books coming out. So to do well is good because there isn't an enormous amount of, of competition. And it kicks off uh, the first lot of stories, which have as their character, that's Live and Let Die, the number two story, set in, comes out in 1954, and they also start Fleming Alf in his pattern. He'd negotiated a deal with the Sunday Times in which he didn't work in the winter. That's rather nice, isn't it? I mean, obviously it affected his salary. Uh, so he spent the winter in Goldeneye, he wrote his novels in Goldeneye, and then came back in the spring, gave them to the publisher, did his work, and the novels came out in the autumn. That's the pattern he worked on. Interestingly enough, you can see the drafts, uh, the Fleming papers ended up, or Ian Fleming's papers, ended up in the Lilly Library in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, and in those, you can see he drafted, he worked really hard. He, like a lot of people, particularly upper class people, he pretended that a gentleman didn't really work. You know, he pretended that he just sort of dashed it off in the afternoon after having a swim and before having some fun. Uh, in fact, he worked incredibly hard at it, and you can see the drafts he did, the hard work he did. So, Casino Royale starts the elements that you're going to see with the Bond stories. And these are elements worth thinking about for those of you who are interested in history, because a standard pattern that we have is that liberation, as it were, whatever you mean by personal liberation or liberalisation, began in the 60s. You know, um, in fact, as you probably are aware, um, the world, you know, described and invented, but you know, in some respects described uh, by Ian Fleming, is already quite liberal, particularly on matters of sexuality, and that was something that was of enormous interest to the readers. Now, if you go back, if you look at classic British same with American, adventure hero stuff, and these are really adventure stories, you know, they're set in a secret service, but you know, they're really adventure stories. If you look at classic adventure stories of the interwar years, they're essentially not homosexual, but they're homosocial. And the, the characters are largely men, uh, the emotional relationship between them sort of they go to bed with each other, but the emotional relationship between them is, you know, the sort of being comrades. So if you look at the John Buchan stories, you know, Richard Hanney and Sandy Arbuthnot are, you know, absolutely, you know, on the same wavelength. And Richard Hanney gets married at the, in the end, and Lady Hanney is described as sort of as an honorary chap. You know, she sort of, <laughs> she sort of shoots and hunts and fishes, just, you know, sort of a man with small breasts kind of position. <laughs> so, so she's described, and, and that was the kind of pattern in the interwar years, the Clubland hero stories. Girls were there simply to be saved from the railway lines as the train sped towards them. You know, that's it, as it, the novels of Sapper, the novels of Buchan. There's slight degree more ambivalence in the Eric Ambler stories by the late 30s. They're actually getting a little bit more interesting. Um, but, you know, these are highly moral accounts, and the same immediately after World War II. The British adventure hero of the late 40s, early 50s, uh, on the radio every week, three feature films made about him, was a character called Dick Barton. Well, Dick Barton was a sort of clear, you know, a sort of as it were, I mean, you know, the British don't really go in for religion, but he was, as it were, what you would imagine a Christian evangelical adventure hero would be. Always a clean, clean chap, but taking part in implausible fights against villains in, hidden in the side of icebergs, that sort of rubbish. Anyway, from that perspective, from that perspective, Bond is very different. And the interesting thing for the modern take is the exact opposite of what feminists tend to have a go at. Feminists tend to have a go at Bond stories as male fantasies. Well, they may or may not, I don't know. I don't spend my time asking other men what their fantasies are. But what is interesting is the extent to which the women are much more um, free than in the classic novels of the period. These are women who have sex with James Bond. Some of them then, you know, turn over onto his side. Some of them try and kill him. Um, these are women who are not defined by either a wish for motherhood or for matrimony. So by the standards of 1950s popular fiction, 
uh, certainly British popular fiction, this was really quite unusual. That's putting it mildly. Second of all, James Bond travels. Now remember, Britain is in a terribly depressing situation in that period. It's been in rationing. You know, I mean, we're talking about rationing including things like petrol. Um, there is none of the opulence you associate with 1950s America. And people had not travelled for many, many years. The upper class had been the only ones that had ever travelled anyway. The working class, the middle class had never really travelled. Um, the upper class had not been able to travel uh, unless you were taking part in war uh, for a while. Uh, they, to give you an idea, scheduled air services across the Atlantic had briefly started in the late summer of 1939. They then stopped for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, and they started again in 1947, not 1946, but the real cost of flying the Atlantic, uh, the real cost of flying the Atlantic was about, in modern terms, about $8,000. Um, so, you know, travel it was not something that was usual. So going to uh, a French ca casino resort was amazing. This one, number two, was much more amazing. Does anybody know where James Bond goes to in Live and Let Die? Yeah, but before that, well actually it's not Jamaica, but it's, it's the West Indies, but before that? New Orleans. Um, no, before that it's New York he goes to. New Orleans is the film. You've got to get your film out of your head. <laughs> Alright? Alright? Um, in, the, in the story he goes to New York and then in fact goes to Florida, doesn't go to New Orleans at all. Anyway, so the beginning of the, uh, the, beginning of the, um, of the novel describes arriving at Idlewild uh, Airport, which is what JFK used to be called. Uh, to anybody reading that, this would have been quite amazing. Nobody in, that, in the readership would have done that flight across the Atlantic. It then describes what it's like going into New York, and you immediately get plunged into the plot. Um, the plot, again, is one that was grounded to a certain extent in anxieties. Again, on the American side, Fleming, as I've said, knew J. Edgar Hoover. And Hoover's great, I mean, Hoover had lots of shticks, but one of Hoover's great arguments in the 50s, and an argument he regularly rolled out, was that America was threatened by subversion, communists. What was the major way that the, sub the subversion was going to occur, anybody? Union? No. Come on. <laughs> Black people. Um, Hoover's idea was that the United States was going to be threatened by exactly the same process that was occurring in the British and French empires, in which the Soviets would try and exploit people who felt oppressed. Um, and indeed, that's one of the major reasons why Hoover was such a supporter of civil rights, of course. Hoover, I mean, it's a very ironic thing. The classic American narrative about civil rights, of course, puts the weight on the 1960s and Martin Luther King and all the rest of it. Actually, it was, in many senses, a bunch of opportunistic white men, Truman with desegregation of the army, Eisenhower uh, with sending the troops into the, uh, into the south, into Arkansas, and Hoover feeding Ar Eisenhower with all this stuff about if we don't do something the communists are going to take over these people. That's you know where, where a lot of the emphasis should be placed. Anyway, this is where you should relate this. What this is all about is about a black sort of criminal network in the United States being run by the communists. And, um, and you know, Bond sort of is sent not to stop that but to stop a manifestation of it and draws into it. And again it's quite interesting because of again what it shows about different views. Now I think it's fair to say as they describe them as sallow. And that was a store that was a major signal. They give them names accordingly. 
Same thing in modern attitude, in a sense, modern by the standards of the 1950s. I don't mean modern. You get the same thing in the discussion of homosexuality at the beginning of From Russia with Love. Okay? So let die. Uh, not a bad story. Lot of tension in it. Three settings. Uh, New York, Florida, and then they go into the West Indies. Not a bad story. Moonraker. Moonraker is the first one set in Britain. And Moonraker presses British anxieties. Ludicrous plot, but, you know, there you go. Um, but, I mean, it's about essentially Britain's on the slide. It's poor, can't afford to be a great power. There is the move towards missiles, we're in the uh, mid-1950s here, and um, a, pro a sort of one of Britain's leading businessmen offers to fund the development of a rocket. And the British government is delighted. Uh, the government is identified, it's the Churchill government which comes in in 1951 to 1955. Okay? Now, Unfortunately, the businessman involved, this is such, so ridiculous, is cheating at cards. And M uh, wonder, worries about this, worries about there's something go, um, odd going on, and tells Bond to find out what's, you know, what the truth of all of this is. And there's a rather splendid uh, discussion of an imaginary London club, Blades, based on Fleming's knowledge. He was a member of three London clubs, was a keen gambler. Uh, based on that discussion, and then essentially what Fleming discovers is that this guy is somebody who'd been a, a, a Nazi during the war, wounded uh, in 1944, captured, had been able to pass himself off as British. In other words, he's pretended to be a wounded, badly wounded British person. Um, and essentially he is running the, in Kent a group of Nazi scientists who are being funded by the Soviets to drop a nuclear bomb on London. So the plot, the plot is not the strong point of Moonraker. Um, it's, it's, it's very well written. It's all set in four days. It's actually quite an exciting story. And it captures again a feature of 1950s novels, and particularly with Fleming, that what you had done in the war established whether you were good or bad. That in a sense, these are novels written in the aftermath, in the shadow of the war, which again is totally different to the films. Okay? Um, Diamonds are forever. You get again Fleming's fascination with America. He comes back to America in this. Pretty bad novel, actually, this one. The plot's a bit incoherent. But one interesting thing from it at the end is the last section is set in Sierra Leone, which is still a British colony. So Fleming, at the end, is able to borrow an anti-aircraft gun, a boffer's gun, off the garrison and shoot down the villain's helicopter. And it's worth bearing in mind that at that point... It still seemed reasonable to see Britain as a great power, obviously ludicrous today, but it still seemed reasonable. And bear in mind, although Britain was very poor, I mean, one of the things that, the world, that world War II had done was it knocked out the economies of pretty well everybody, bar the United States. And in, say, 1954, 1955, Britain's, you know, it's the third state to have the atom bomb, it's the third state to have the hydrogen bomb, it's got the second largest navy in the world after the United States, and although it no longer is the imperial power in India, um, it's still the leading imperial power um, in the Pacific, Western Pacific, in uh, Africa, uh, in the West Indies, it's still a major state, and therefore it seems credible to have Bond as a major character. And Bond himself Himself can be seen. If you want to place him as a historian, you could see him as an example of what they called at the time the new Elizabethan age. Queen Elizabeth came to the throne in 1952, uh, is crowned in 
1953, which is when Casino Royale comes out, and there's a sort of moment of optimism in Britain, a sense that yes, um, you know, we're no longer the top dog, but nevertheless, we're still a major power, we're, just, we're not finished. And I think you can locate the start of the Bond corpus there. From Russia with Love, another example of Fleming using real live people. Um, he actually has a discussion at the beginning uh, of, uh, in the Soviet um, uh, Army Intelligence Service in which real people are being named. Um, Dr. No, the British garrison in Jamaica, uh, can be used at the end, and a British warship can be used at the end to tidy up. Britain is still a major power. Goldfinger, uh, the British help the Americans. Again, the fascination with America, but the British are still able to do things. For your eyes only as a set of short stories. Thunderball. Thunderball is where the change occurs. Now, in Thunderball, you don't anymore have Spectre as the villain, which was based on a real live organisation, Soviet uh, Army Intelligence. Uh, sorry, you don't have Smirch, you don't have Smirch, you have Spectre. Spectre is totally invented, run by an invented character, um, Stavros Blofeld, and the novel is fantastical. It's in a sense unreal. And you could say that from then on, the novels in their plots become increasingly implausible. Now there are several different ways you can look at that. One way you can look at it is to say after the Suez Crisis of 1956, Britain's decline accelerates and um, that in a way it's no longer credible, no longer works for Fleming to present um, um, Britain as he'd done in the earlier novels and that he, oh, he has to take recourse in sort of fantasy. That's one way of looking at it. Um, and the quality of the writing deteriorates as well, interestingly enough. Number two way of looking at, <coughs> looking at it is to say well, actually, he was getting exhausted. Although he was born in 1908, he was an extraordinarily heavy smoker. He was an extraordinarily uh, heavy drinker. And he ate scrambled eggs, fatty food, as if there was no tomorrow. Um, and this obviously had an effect on him. Um, you know, he was smoking about 60 heavy-duty cigarettes a day unfiltered a day. You know, this is you know, tough stuff. Don't do it, OK? Um, the third reason, and this is always where you've got sort of the dating of psychology, is to work out the effect of his personal life. And it's a story about how Gateskill, of course, was married, but I mean, the um, this and a Tory song in London, where sort of up and coming Tory MPs would sort of try and demonstrate that and they're in the corner with the lead opposition. The thing that's interesting is it's a fascinating example of a different society. If you look at the late 50s, Fleming, for that matter, Harold Macmillan, the Prime Minister from 1963, another old Etonian, um, and uh, uh, the Queen's cousin, Lord Mountbatten, the head of the Navy, in that little world as cuckolds. Um, but uh, it's a, uh, it makes
The only novel of the later novels that's good is this one. And in many senses, this is the most unusual one. Because as anybody will know if you've read it, most of you will never have read it, this is the novel written from the woman's perspective. So this novel is written from the perspective, James Bond doesn't turn up till 60% of the way through. It's about the life of this woman who subsequently has a brief fling, fling with Bond. And it's a really interesting piece of work, a man writing as a woman. And it does remind one, Fleming was not a very nice man. He was a terrible snob. But he could certainly write. I mean, he also wrote one of the most famous children's stories. Anybody know? Chizzy Chizzy Bang Bang, he wrote a lot of uh, rather good travel journalism. I mean, you know, he was a talented writer. Anyway, so we go through the Honor Majesty's Secret Service, terrible novel. You Only Live t Twice, terrible novel. Man with a Golden Gun, terrible, and finished off by Kingsley Amos, in fact, because after Fleming died. And this one were short stories at the end. Octopussy, a very good short story, but this, this was short stories. So, Fleming himself, the work's sliding, the quality is declining. Fleming, you know, it's really not very good. But he's rescued by the silver screen, which produces a lot of money, which is what he'd wanted all along. He'd always wanted his stuff to go into the silver screen. Now, what's the first time James Bond appears on the screen, anybody? No. 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 It's interesting, it's really interesting. It's a trick question because I put up Dr. No where it says it's the first. Dr. No is the first feature film, which is 1962. In fact, James Bond first appears on the screen in 1954. Version of Canary Row. You know, the, um, the, the Shifra gets, as a story, gets shot dead at the end by an, um, a Soviet agent. It's the only story in which the villain isn't. Anyway, the villain is played by Peter Lorre, not knowing that the cameras are still rolling. He gets up and walks off. <laughs> okay? Um, but what it showed is that James Bond was ultimately malleable. James Bond in the, in the 1954 American version is played by the American. He's Jimmy Bond, okay? Um, the um, uh, Felix Leiter, his CIA sidekick, becomes Clarence Leiter, his MI6 sidekick, and it showed the malleability of it. But for the rest of the 50s, there was no filming of James Bond, essentially because the American studios did not believe that a British secret, servant, a secret say, uh, service agent would work with the American public. You know, they just didn't believe that it would, it would work. Fine to have Brits who adopt American accents and who star in America, as in American things like Cary Grant, but not to have a Brit playing a Brit. Isn't going to work. And essentially what happens, and also there's a complicated row about uh, the copyright of Thunderball, uh, which goes up to the High Court, though that's only a minor factor. Essentially what happens is these two characters, neither of whom, it has to be said, are at the leading light of the uh, film industry, are chances, and they see an opportunity. They buy off Fleming, the film rights, they're very clever, they buy the film rights not just of all the James Bond stories already written, but of all the ones that might be written and the film rights to the character. They then turn around to United Artists and they ask for money to produce it. They set up their own production company, there it is, Aeon Productions, the one that's still running. And, they, and United Artists cough up for three films as B-movies. And the first one is set in Jamaica because the British government at that stage, Jamaica is still a British colony, is offering money if you make films in British colonies. So that's why they do that one first. Uh, and it works very well. Designed for the American market, 
um, because as you will be aware uh, the plot is about an attempt to uh, destroy the missile tests at Cape Canaveral so that's great that was going to work and of course at that stage the world's leading film market is the United States the world's second largest film market in 1962 is Britain so if you can do a film that works with both you're there and the broccoli and Saltzman are very clever uh, Fleming made it quite clear whom he wanted to play James Bond. Anybody know? David Niven. And the Daily Express, Britain's leading newspaper at the time in terms of its circulation, which was running James Bond as a strip cartoon, asked the readers and they also said David Niven. Saltzman and Broccoli, David Niven was a public school figure, went to Stowe not to Eton, but a public school figure from the 1930s. He'd been in the films like The Charge of the Light Brigade. He was not young um, and you couldn't believe he would kill somebody. You know, you just couldn't. Um, so... Um, yeah, I mean, the reason Connolly is convincing is you can actually believe he would throttle somebody. You know, no, no, no sort of touchy-feely thing like shooting them, but you actually come close, OK? Now, Saltzman and Broccoli ignored them. They went for Connery, who was a, had a mid-Atlantic voice, Scottish working-class accent, mid-Atlantic voice that didn't sound as though his accent was marinated in the British class system, and it worked. From Russia with Love, not got the American side, but really raises the ante on the girls, has some marvellous scenes, uh, particularly the fight out with Robert Shaw on the train, um, and it works even better. So, United Artists put a lot of money into the third one. Goldfinger. It's in Goldfinger that you actually get a, a film made in which they make pr prepared sets. You know, the gold vaults at Fort Knox, um, the, uh, the uh, place in Kentucky, Goldfinger's base in Kentucky, and everything pulls together. The cars, you know, the MGs, the girls, um, the sort of script um, a plot that is going to work for the Americans, and of course they adjust it for the Americans. If you know the novel Goldfinger, you will know that in the novel it is the Soviets who provide Goldfinger with the device to take out the, uh, the, um, um, you know, the stuff, you know, the, the gold vaults, um, to irradiate it, the nuclear device. In the film, it's of course the Chinese. Just as in the film, Dr. No, it is Chinese agents who Dr. No is seen, in Mao suits, who Dr. No is seen talking to in his vault, uh, in his uh, uh, headquarters. And in this one, of course, uh, Goldfinger has an expert, a missile expert, who is Dr. Ling, who again is a Chinaman. So it plays into America's anxieties at the time of the Vietnam War about the communists being out to get us, but particularly the Chinese communists. Um, and, you know, once you've got by then, the, this is jumped in, we've got Thunderball in the middle, uh, what you've got is high set values, lots of money being spent, amazing special effects, girls, rockets, sharks, the big sort of special effect, you know, those are the big characters, and it really makes vast sums of money. These films do fantastically well, not just in Anglophone film markets, but in France, in West Germany, in Italy, in Japan, where this one is set, where he's known as Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Uh, they do extraordinarily well, and they're actually become a license to make money. Um, and this one, of course, is not generally terribly popular, but actually brilliant film. Again, for the American market, you have an American villain, uh, Telly Savalas. Uh, you have the most fantastic ski chases. You have Duke Ellington, who turns up, of course. Um, it, it, you know, music, but he's actually it is successful films. Dies of Forever, the only film that's really got a real strong sense of. Again, set largely in America. As an example of appealing to the American audience, take the joke, which would have meant nothing to them. Um, when uh, James Bond is captured by Blofeld uh, and is held on the, uh, the rig off the Californian coast, and Blofeld wants to show him what he can achieve with his space-mounted laser, the sort of thing we all want for Christmas, and... Um, and he, uh, Blofeld turns to the scientist and says, where's the missile over now? 
and um, the guy says Kansas and he says oh well nobody will notice if we blow that up wait till it's over Washington that's a joke that's a joke for the American audience and in fact Britain has had it this is 1971 Britain has had it in this film the British has, uh, you know um, Blofeld says to Bond, what on earth are you doing here, Mr. Bond? I'm not even threatening your pathetic little country. And you see in the film the destruction of by Blofeld's missiles, of nuclear devices on Earth. You see um, American Minutemen. You see a Soviet nuclear submarine. You see Chinese missiles, but nothing that's British. Live and Let Die, again, the first of the Moore films, not a bad one, actually, again, very much to do with America. Drug running from the West Indies into America, New Orleans being out of control, but much more New York being out of control. Very much for the American market. And the last one of the Roger Moore ones, 1985, A View to a Kill, again, America. So essentially you get the Americanization, which is brilliant. It's why it works. It actually moves from being a British product to a company. Saltzman, who had been a Canadian, uh, sold up to Broccoli, who was an American. And one of the ironic things about this is it's actually one of the best examples of American film enterprise. I mean, you know, it's now currently run by Barbara Broccoli, who's the daughter of the Albert Broccoli, and by Michael G. Wilson, who was uh, uh, um, Albert Broccoli's stepson. And, you know, they do fantastically well, making it, of course, mostly outside America, uh, and using non a lot of non-American talent, but actually most of the profit accrues to the American production company. Um, you then go to Timothy Dalton. Timothy Dalton is the one who is closest to the bond of the novels. He's the one who is most introspective. The bond of the novels is a bit of a dis depressive. Uh, um, Timothy Dalton is the closest. In this one, License to Kill, very much about America, set in Isthmus, of course, Panama, 1989, which is the year the Americans go in with G General Noriega, this is, you know, all the marks on his face. But the point is that the, the villain is running drugs into America. Uh, and as you probably know if you've seen the film, using Christian evangelical uh, uh, television station, it's, it's hilariously funny, although probably not for some Americans. Decades. Um, well, first of all, You know, there's really not much of it at all. Whereas, you know, the Roger Moore films, you were generally running at about two women a film, and there was more emphasis on the, on the sex side. Sex has gone, uh, in all practical terms. What has instead become the case is violence. <laughs> These are much more violent than they used to be. Um, I did a program for BBC Radio 4, which is the main serious channel, for New Year's Eve, no, New Year's Day, uh, 1999 and they rebroadcasted it on New Year's Day 2000 on James Bond and we interviewed for that a chap called Oleg Ryevsky who'd been the KGB station chief in London and also an MI6 agent and um, he told, so he was a spy and in the end defected to Britain um, 
And uh, he said that, you know, one of the things, he said he liked watching the James Bond films, but he said one of the things he found really disgusting about Goldeneye was the large number of Russians that were almost casually killed uh, in Goldeneye, you know, by Bond as he's going careering round the streets of St. Petersburg with a commandeered tank. Um, he said two other things that were <laughs> really quite amusing. Uh, one was... The Central Committee of the Communist Party is the popular. The reason that's funny is if you know your James Bond films, you remember the Din Octopussy, there's a scene at the beginning in which the Central Committee is seen considering whether to attack. So more interesting. About we wouldn't close down. Don't worry, we're made of sterner stuff. But you know, it's and you know, people are stuck. Relatives they don't like. I mean, you know, you know, it varies, and you get some nice holiday clips of where she's been over the last year. But that's it. What they from late nineties on must be is they started going through the James Bond films. On a now, remember, dinky little country. Your place is a continent pretending to be a country. We're a dinky little country. We're all one time zone. If you drove from here to Tennessee, you'd have gone through England, and you know, we're small. So, there were, at that stage, just four terrestrial channels, of which two of them dominated. And it's possible to have a programme which most of the country watches. Okay? So ITV, it went out on the commercial channel. ITV, which was the commercial channel, uh, used to so show these. Well, would anybody tell me, like to tell me, we've got some clever people here, what British institution had to cope with the fact that a James Bond... take a much quicker charge which is why the you know the kettle heats up much quicker so the national grid we have a national grid for electric power used to have to keep three power stations extra on the grid operating on Christmas afternoon to cope with the power surges uh, it gives you an example of one of the more amusing sides so I've got time for about two questions questions not speeches please <laughs> If there's no questions, I'll talk a bit more. Anybody got a question? Yes, sir. Um, you said his writing started to taper off around Thunderball. Was he still doing the same deal where he came off in the winters to write that, or at that point did he retire? He, in a sense, at that stage, had stopped working for the Sunday Times. Um, he just, and now what I mean, it's the quality of the writing starts to diminish. And I suppose his inventiveness had deteriorated. Uh, and also the other problem is there's always the danger you go on doing the same bloody thing, which is, you know, what happened with J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling started well and then just went out of control. Next one. Um, yes, Richard. 
the uh, the uh, uh, John McRae. Yes. Um, it's interesting that uh, that Smiley's uh, wife is named Dan. Yes. And she is. Uh, I, yes. On, on, is that come from? It might have done. I think it might have done. I don't know. They're from the same social milieu, from the same social milieu. And in fact, Carre for a while taught at Eton uh, before going into the intelligence services. Um, Carre, I think, was good on the Cold War. But if you want a counterpart to Bond, somebody who I think is a better writer and better than either Carre or Fleming is Len Dayton. I think Len Dayton's uh, Ipcris file and his um, funeral in Berlin, both of which were filmed, were truly excellent. Why they didn't work is much more interesting because they didn't transfer to the American market. You know, essentially, Harry Palmer, his protagonist, played by Michael Caine in The Ipcris File, is a sort of downtrodden guy who's bothered by his bosses, is short of money, whereas Fleming never has any problems about that. Uh, and so, that, you know, they're, they're, but actually, I think it's a better film. And Funeral in Berlin is a brilliant film. Yes, sir? So my teenage kids yes. view the old James Bonds as unwatchable, funny, mm -hmm. just ridiculous. How does that fit into how we view the 50s or the 60s and, and isn't... Um, I, think, I think to see men wearing... Daniel Craig, and Daniel Craig is to fight Bourne films. That's essentially what's happened. The Bourne films did very well, very attractive, as you correctly say, to the younger market. So the Bond films were reconfigured to be like the Bourne films. And you're absolutely right. Older films in which... Well, let me give you an example which no today, no young person today would put up with. In Goldfinger, soon after the beginning, there is a golf course in which Bond and Goldfinger play a game of golf. Essentially, in filmic terms, they're establishing the character, and both characters are moving the plot forward. It's nine minutes. There is no violence apart from a ball being squashed at the end by odd job. There is no way in a modern adventure film you would do that. The modern emphasis is on movement and energy and chases and fights, which is why the Bond films have become much more fighty, which I don't like. I feel I have to go and see them because, you know, that's my, you know, I, you know I've written books on it. Actually, I don't particularly like the new ones, but I could understand your children having a different response. You're absolutely right, the 1960s films just don't work. They connected with Austin Powers, actually. Yeah, 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 no, I could understand that. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, in regards to Dr. No and the other uh, East Asian villains, yes. was that a, them making them Asian a thing of them films? Or did the books and the films both tie into the sort of Fu Manchu and Yellow Cricket stereotypes? Well, that's again a very good question. Um, Fleming himself referred to his interest in Fu Manchu. Just to remind people, Fu Manchu is the creation of a writer called Patrick Sarsfeld, writing under the pseudonym of Sax Roma, about this international conspiracy. Uh, hidden in British docklands, which is trying to bring down the British Empire. That then translates uh, after the First World War, and in fact it goes on into the 1950s, as kind of, as you say, yellow, yellow peril stuff. Um, there is a bit of that, a bit of that in the Fleming novels, but he tends to be more focused on the Soviets. You know, he, that's the whole point about Smirsch. Smirsch is the Soviet secret agent. It is not it is not um, the Chinese. And then when he creates Spectre, Spectre is run by Blofeld, who is presented as somebody from Gdansk. You know, again, not Chinese. Um, but you're absolutely right, in the films, uh, the, the Yellow Peril becomes a much stronger theme in the 1960s. It then dips 
you know, really dips. And in the night, you know, you're now into sort of cosmopolitan megalomaniacs. It's very difficult to find a villain now that isn't going to make somebody upset, which is why so many British actors have a marvellous career in Hollywood, because the only villains that are acceptable are the British, and the British will never sue or complain. So every, every other nationality will complain about it, you see. Uh, I mean, Anthony Hopkins, for example, a classic example of a, ca a character who made his fortune out of Hollywood's need for a British villain. <laughs> Next one. Well, that was easy, wasn't it? I thought somebody would ask me something difficult. Okay, if those of you who are interested, you could do exactly the same idea if you took, for example, uh, Christie, Agatha Christie and the Poirot stories, if you took Superman, any character that's been going for a long time, how they are presented differently is itself a matter of interest. And for those of you who are historians, what you've got is you've got contextual change, change in broader society and in the international system and how that affects things, and then the specific, as it were, change that is true of the actual economics of how those films or novels are made. So that's, you know, and since I mentioned Christie, I'll just end on Christie. Christie, again, is interesting because if you read Agatha Christie novels of the 1920s into the 30s, but even some of the later ones, Passage to Frankfurt, which I think is about 1968, is another good example, she's actually very interested in the idea of conspiracies, international conspiracies. The best example of that is the Big Four. And Agatha Christie's Big Four begins with Poirot and Hastings in Paris having survived an attempt to kill them. And Poirot explains to Hastings that, quote, behind everything, quote, behind the Bolshevism, quote, behind the labour troubles, there is this conspiracy of the Big Four. And the Big Four press all sorts of anxiety buttons. So number four, the lesser one, is the British assassin. Number three is the American plutocrat. Number two is the French female scientist. And number one is a mysterious Chinaman who's got access to nuclear power. Well, you know, she doesn't really know what nuclear power means, but the idea... And, and it turns out in the end that this lot have got their base underneath a mountain in Switzerland, and Poirot and Hastings with a group of the Swiss police, you know, sort them out. Now that is totally against our image of Agatha Christie, and in fact when the BBC recently redid the, uh, the Poirot stories with David Suchet, with the big four, they present that as a fantasy of a, somebody who's mad, you know, the villain is mad, is based in London. But actually if you read Agatha Christie, it's a real it's a real conspiracy. And a whole host of her 1920s ones are to do with these conspiracies. So the idea that behind something there is a, this threat uh, is, a, is a one that is insistent. And you know, you have to say, if you look at the modern age with the attempt by other states to... Um, you know, to use uh, um, technology as a sort of, you know, sort of leap over to destroy communication systems. You can absolutely see about the way in which the idea of a conspiracy to a degree is true. I mean, you know, that's the nature of Soviet whole now Russian hybrid warfare. It involves conspiracy. Um, and, you know, societies, without going mad about all conspiracies, need to protect themselves against them. If you want to be depressed, I'll just depress you for a second. About two years ago, I gave the Har Harmons Lecture at the American Air Force Academy. And the conversation at lunchtime was fascinating. Here was this group of senior American Air Force officers, and they were having a conversation because there'd just been something that had gone wrong on the east coast of the United States in which a lot of traffic signals had gone down and the suspicion was that this had been, you know, a test from an outside power to just see if it could interrupt them. So this lot were discussing whether they thought um, foreign powers would be able to take down American jets. <laughs> 
and they came to the conclusion that they didn't think they could take down Air Force jets because the systems were much more um, self-contained, but they reckoned that they could probably take down a civilian jet already, in which case they thought that at some stage they'd do it just to make sure that they could actually get the technology to work. That's, you know, that's, I mean, if you think about James Bond plots, that's not a w million miles away from the plots of that kind of story. Anyway, thank you very much for coming to listen. Dr. Black for being here. We have a little present for him. Oh, that's so, kind. There you go. Thank you. Yes, and also uh, remind all of you to please come out to the other two lectures in the Lecture Series. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you.